So I'm gonna do something a little different with this uh, YouTube video here. Usually I try to take uh, one idea and shorten it down into a couple minutes and talk about it. But on Sunday, we were doing a recap as we dove back into the book of Romans. And I tried to sort of pull back a little bit and talk about some of the major schools of interpretation when it comes to looking at Paul's writings and kind of systematizing what's happening in the background when he writes. Um, and really this comes around uh, Romans in particular, because Romans in particular is where Paul talks about justification by faith, which is one of the key ideas for Paul. Now, it's not actually Paul's uh, biggest idea. Uh, Paul primarily in his letters is concerned with the idea of being reconciled to God, and he's interested in this idea of us being in Christ, that we are wrapped up in the story of Christ's faithfulness and Christ's ability to um, reinvent the world and reconcile it to God. But in Romans, he hits on justification by faith, and there's a number of different ways that this has been approached. Now, the first one, is called the Tübingen School, and it comes from the Tübingen University in Germany in the 1800s, where scholars were looking at Paul, but they were taking what had been happening in the decades earlier in Old Testament source critical theory, where uh, German theologians had been looking at primarily uh, Torah and realizing that, oh, maybe this is written by different sources. Uh, maybe this isn't just one person writing this, but different people have written different stories and someone has come along after and put them together. And if we can understand the sources and who those uh, people were who were writing, we can better understand what's going on underneath the text. Well, they take that theory and they start applying it to the New Testament. And one of the major figures here is a guy named F.C. Bauer, and he starts doing this with Pauline literature. And what he sees is a conflict in the early um, centuries of Christianity between the Petrine group who wants to maintain a very, what he sees as Jewish perspective on Christianity, of doing the right things and keeping the right laws and following the right traditions, and the Pauline group of believers who wants to transition that to a new uh, religious framework of believing the right things uh, about God and therefore being part of the community. And what he sees underneath all of the New Testament texts is this sort of civil war that's happening between these two groups um, where they are fighting it out. And after the fact, what happens is that the Pauline group wins out and the New Testament letters then get edited and redacted to kind of smooth over the differences and sort of make it look like there's a more cohesive Christianity through the whole period. So he's actually quite suspect of what we actually read in the New Testament. Um, he thinks that this comes sort of in the second century after the fact, somebody coming along and smoothing things out to make it look like the Pauline Christianity that wins out was sort of always the, the dominant narrative through that. Now, if you know anything about uh, German philosophical theory, uh, you'll recognize this as sort of a Hegelian dialectical approach. If thesis, antithesis, conflict, and synthesis. Um, and so they're applying sort of the philosophical thinking of the day uh, to the New Testament. The problem here is that that really oversimplifies um, not just the New Testament, but how human relationships work. Uh, Paul and Peter are not necessarily opposites. Uh, they are humans who have conflict with each other. They see things differently, but they're still partners and colleagues and people who are trying to work things out together. And so when we really oversimplify uh, Peter and Paul into opposites, or when we do this anytime in our world, I think we set ourselves up for a conflict narrative that'll really set us down an unhealthy path. And I think um, in terms of our Christianity today, this can happen really quickly. When we buy into conflict narratives, we will see things like other churches or other theologians that we read, even other believers, um, as our opposites, as our enemies, rather than our siblings and someone we can learn from. And I would actually argue that the beauty of the New Testament is telling us that when we come together with people 
who might see Christ and might see Christianity slightly differently than we do, but they have a conviction and a trust in the story of Jesus at the core of their faith that we can actually learn something from each other. And that when we do that, we are actually going to come out of this with a more healthy, more robust, uh, more well-developed picture of what Christianity was always meant to be about. I think it's actually really important that we not see those who disagree with us as our enemies or our opposites, but we actually see them as our siblings, our brothers and sisters who have something to teach us. So that's the two being in school. It's F.C. Bauer. Um, it's actually a quite critical approach to the New Testament, but it becomes a narrative that uh, is very dominant in Protestantism. And there obviously is some truth in there. Obviously, there are conflicts between Peter and Paul. Uh, but when that narrative of conflict becomes too dominant, um, we actually get off on an unhealthy start. The second major school is the archaeology of religion school. This again is a quite uh, critical approach to the New Testament, but it comes from scholars who are interested in the anthropology and the sociology of early Christianity. So some of the figures here you might know of are Elaine Pagels and Bart Ehrman, uh, both skeptical, critical writers in Christianity. Um, but what they see is Christianity emerging uh, from Judaism and within Judaism as a ritualistic, traditional religion, much like Judaism. And then they see the influence of Greco-Roman philosophy on it. And they rightly understand that Paul very much does have a foot in both worlds. Paul is a Jew, a deeply religious Jew, but he is also very well steeped in Greco-Roman art and philosophy and rhetoric. And what they see him trying to do is Hellenized or intensely sort of Greekify his Jewish roots into a new religious philosophy that's more palatable with Greco-Roman thought. He spends a lot of time with uh, Gentiles and Romans, and so he's trying to make his religion make more sense in this new cosmopolitan world, especially in cities like Rome. Now, again, the problem with that is it sort of um, doesn't give a lot of credence to the deeply Jewish rabbinical ways that Paul writes about Jesus in the New Testament. Um, the way that Paul prays, the way that Paul will use the Old Testament. And he's very comfortable sort of interpreting the Old Testament in rabbinical ways to point towards Jesus. So it's really important to understand that Paul is not trying to take away from the Jewishness of Jesus. Paul is a Jew. He never abandons that. He never abdicates that. He sees himself as a Jew. His worldview is Jewish. Um, and he wants to maintain that. Yeah, he can code shift when he needs to, and he can speak Greco-Roman philosophy when he's talking to people who see the world that way, but Paul very much maintains his Jewishness all throughout. And I don't think it's helpful then to say that Christianity is a Hellenized version of Judaism, because I think that really diminishes something that's really important to Paul, and that is his Jewishness. And this is where the new perspective on Paul comes along. Um, it's really not that new, as I mentioned on Sunday. It uh, emerges in the early to mid 20th century, but one of the major figures is a guy named E.P. Sanders. One of the major current figures is N.T. Wright, who a lot of people will know, and who writes uh, about Paul and the new perspective on Paul today. But E.P. Sanders starts uh, listening to Jewish theologians and Jewish rabbis, and what he starts realizing is that Jews don't have this same dichotomy between faith and works. Um, believing God and doing what God asks are not uh, a tension in Judaism. One flows naturally from the other, and they don't see a problem there. And so he coins this term covenantal nomism. Nomism is from the Greek nomos, which means law. And we all know that in the Old Testament, law is a big deal, keeping the law. But what he sees is this covenantal commitment to keeping the law. And covenantal just means uh, a relational or, or, or um, experiencing promise and commitment to each other. Uh, that's why they keep the law. And what he looks at is in Judaism where uh, Jews see themselves as the chosen people. They see themselves as uniquely blessed by this God who chose them.
So everything that the Jews do, um, all of the laws that they keep, all of the ritual and tradition that's there in Judaism is not there to earn God's approval or win God's love. Um, it's not there to keep God loving you. It is only there as a response to the fact that Jews saw themselves as chosen and loved by God. Uh, this is what he calls covenantal gnomism. They don't see a conflict because law is your response to the fact that God already loves you, right? Um, you don't do anything to earn God's love. You never did. And so then when he goes back to Paul, he says, well, Paul then can't be arguing against the Judaizers who want to earn God's love by doing the right things because Jews never believed that. They believed that they were loved, they were chosen, they were elect. So therefore, the issue that Paul is critiquing is not works. Um, it's not doing the right things. That's the normal, natural outflow of knowing that you're loved. That's what changes you. When you know you're accepted and loved, you begin to do uh, life the way that God does. What Paul's critiquing then is the markers of ethnic identity. And again, Paul doesn't leave his Judaism, so he doesn't see uh, ethnic identity as a bad thing. I think, in fact, he celebrates those markers for those who see the cultural significance of it. What he's critiquing is the idea that markers of ethnic identity can be what set you apart within God's story. And Paul says, no, um, kosher diet, circumcision, these things can no longer be the markers that show you're part of God's community. Because with the story of Christ um, and, and the resurrection of Christ in particular, um, God has expanded the story to all people. At one point, God chose the Jewish people. Now God has chosen all peoples. Right? And so the markers of showing that you recognize that and you accept that can't be your ethnic markers. It needs to be something new. And this is where Paul uses the term justification by faith. You're no longer justified by your ethnic markers. You are justified by your faith or your trust. But again, the dynamic here is not a dichotomy between what you believe and what you do because you're always going to do the right thing. That's the natural, normal outflow of knowing you're loved. With justification by faith is the idea that you now trust in the faithfulness of Jesus. This is where it gets a little technical because when Paul talks about we are justified by our faith in Jesus Christ or we are justified by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, those two phrases in English would be the same thing in Greek. It's called a genitive and it can be objective or subjective, but how you're going to read that comes down to what you think Paul is trying to say. Is Paul critiquing works? Um, therefore, you're not justified by what you do, you're justified by what you believe about or in Jesus, or is Paul critiquing ethnic identity as a marker? Works are what you're always going to naturally do when you know that you're loved. Therefore, what signals you as part of God's community is your trust in the faithfulness of Jesus to expand the story to all peoples. And this is where when you take Paul's Jewishness seriously and you read his writings through a more Jewish lens of faith and works not being a tension at all, I think it makes a lot more sense to see him saying, we are now invited into the story of God by our trust in the faithfulness of Jesus because Jesus goes to the cross. He dies. He allows humanity to enact our worst violent fantasies out on him. But in his resurrection, he overcomes sin and death. He overcomes everything that divides us from each other and from God. And because what he overcomes is a burden of all humanity, then therefore the story is now expanded to everyone. Where at one point God had chosen the Jews, now God has chosen all peoples. And this is actually what God has always been building towards, that God has always loved everyone. And now we get to f see that fully. We get to experience that fully in Jesus. And we mark our participation in that story 
by trusting in the faithfulness of Jesus to do good for everyone. So that's the new perspective on Paul. Again, it's not all that new, but that's probably what you're going to encounter uh, for the most part when you're reading Pauline scholars who are looking at Paul today. So, tubing in school, the conflict narrative, Christianity is born out of a thesis, antithesis, conflict synthesis, and the New Testament then later is rewritten to smooth it all out. The archaeology of religion approach, another skeptical approach that sees Paul trying to Greekify or Hellenize his Jewish roots to make it more palatable to the Gentiles and the Romans, or the new perspective in Paul that actually sees Paul as a Jew approaching Jesus through that Jewish identity, but realizing now that the story has been expanded to all peoples everywhere and that our participation in the story is signaled as we trust in the faithfulness of Jesus. There you go.